Welcome to Memory, Lesson 8, Factors Affecting the Accuracy of Eyewitness Testimony. My name is Nick Redshaw and I have over 16 years experience of teaching A-level psychology. I'm also co-author of the highly successful independent learner series of student workbooks available exclusively on Amazon. As we have seen from previous sections, memory is fragile and easily distorted by other factors such as interference and absence of retrieval cues. In the previous section you will recall that we looked at proactive interference where old inter information interferes with new information. According to Bartlett 1932, our memories are distorted by existing schemas, old information, such as stereotypes about particular groups of people that cause us to misinterpret the situation, the new information. This is known as reconstructive memory. An example of this can be seen in Old Port and Postman's 1947 research where participants were shown a picture of a black man being threatened by a white man holding a razor. Later, when participants were asked to recall the event, most said it was the black man holding the razor. They concluded that previous racial stereotypes at the time affected the recall of the new information. In addition, throughout the course we have shown that people will respond to a particular way to please the researcher, known as responder bias. This leads to the person answering in a way as they, as they portrayed in a positive light and not look stupid. From this it is clear that when people are asked to recall specific details about real life events they have witnessed such as accidents and crimes, people will fill in any gaps in their memory as they don't want to look stupid or are trying to be helpful with existing schemas. According to Brown 1986, the problem with this is that eyewitness testimony has, has been found by judges, defense attorneys and psychologists to be extremely unreliable, yet jurors find such testimony highly believable. In this section we will look in more detail at the facts that affect the accuracy of information given by eyewitnesses with specific focus on misleading information, post-event discussion and anxiety. So firstly, factors affecting the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, misleading information including leading questions and post-event discussion. Loftus and Palmer in 1974 believe that eyewitness testimony is fragile and can easily be distorted or reconstructed by leading questions. These leading questions are a type of misleading information that affect the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. They are known as leading because the phrasing of the question or use of emotive words in a police interview can elicit a particular response. Leading questions. Loftus and Palmer's 1974 study of the effects of language on recall in eyewitness testimony the aim, to show that leading questions distort eyewitness testimony. Procedures. A lab experiment using an independent group design. Participants were 45 American students chosen from whoever was available. They were then shown a video of a car accident and then allocated to one of five conditions. In each, co each condition, participants were asked a critical question. In the first condition, participants were asked, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? The verb hit was replaced in each other condition by one of the following verbs. Smashed, collided, bumped, contacted. Okay, if you're using our workbook or your teacher has downloaded our workbook from TESS, answer the following questions. Or, if you haven't got a workbook, on a piece of paper, answer the following questions. Identify the operationalized independent variable and dependent variable in this study for two marks. You may want to pause the video at this point in order to answer the questions. Okay, welcome back. So, identify the operationalized independent variable and dependent variable. Hopefully here, for the independent variable, you've said the verb used in each critical question, i.e. smashed, hit, etc. And for the dependent variable, the estimated speed each participant gave to how fast the car was going. Now operationalized is it how you're going to measure it. So here for the dependent variable, the estimated speed is the operationalized part of that statement. Okay, the next question, complete the following sentence about long-term memory. Tick one box only. The sampling technique used in Loftus and Palmer's 1974 study was a. Stratified B. Volunteer C. Random D. Opportunity
Okay? If you remember back to the actual procedures, it was from whoever was available. Therefore, that's opportunity sampling. And the next question, outline one strength and one limitation of the sampling technique used to select participants that you have chosen above. Okay, welcome back. So here the question only asks you to choose or a strength and weakness of the sampling technique you've chosen. So you may have got the above question wrong. However, if you've written the strengths and weaknesses of the one you've chosen correctly, that's fine. However, the most likely strengths and weaknesses is opportunity sampling. And a strength of opportunity is its convenient method. It saves time and money. Limitation. Research bias is an issue as they may choose participants based on who they like the look of. Nice and simple. Okay, the results of the study. As you can see from the chart, smashed had an estimate of 40-ish uh, miles per hour. Then going down, collided, bumped, hit, contacted. Okay, the question here then, a maths question. Translate the information from the graph into numerical forms. Translate the information from the graph into numerical form. Right then, so for smashed, about 40.8 miles per hour. Collided, about 39. Bumped, about 38. Hit, 34.8. Contacted, 32. And what conclusions can you draw from the descriptive statistics about the effects of leading questions on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony? Okay then, so simply here, the results show that the verb conveyed an impression that the speed the car was travelling and this altered the participants' perceptions, i.e. the more emotive the verb, i.e. when the verb smashed was used, the faster the estimate, 40.8 miles per hour, compared to when the verb hit was used at 34 miles per hour. In other words, eyewitness testimony might be biased by the way questions are asked after a crime is committed. So what are the real life implications of this research for police interviews for two marks? What are the real life implications of this for police interviews? So here, the conclusion that leading questions can affect memory has important implications for interviewing witnesses, both by the police immediately or soon after the, an event, and also by lawyers in court some time later. Interviewers should avoid leading questions and should be careful to word questions in ways that do not suggest an answer to the person they are interviewing. Evaluation. Strengths. This was a lab experiment with high levels of construct control so it's possible to repeat the study easily improving its reliability. Cause and effect can be established. The research findings support have helped shape police interview techniques to ensure that eyewitness testimony is more accurate. Limitations. The artificial setting of the laboratory experiment may lead to low internal validity as the participants may just be reacting to demand characteristics and behaving in a way to please the researcher, known as social desirability, therefore making it difficult to conclude that the findings were, gen were generally affected by the IV. The video clips used by the study by Loftus and Palmer do not have the same emotional impact as witnessing a real-life accident. Outline why, why this might be a problem when drawing conclusions from the findings of this study, and you may want to pause the, the video at this point in order to answer the questions.
So, one limitation of the research is that it lacks mundane realism, also known as ecological validity. Participants viewed video clips rather than being present at, at a real life accident. As the video clip does not have the same emotional impact as witnessing a real life accident, the participant would be less likely to pay attention and less motivated to be accurate in their judgments. Okay, the next, explain why it may be difficult to generalize the findings and conclusions of Loftus and Palmer's study to a wider population. Okay then, the answer here is Loftus and Palmer used stu student participants in both studies. It may be that students are not representative of the general population and therefore it may be difficult to generalize from the results of this study to people in general. For example, students will usually be young and it is possible that people's memories are better when they are young. Okay, true or false? Reconstructive memory causes new information to, to be distorted by existing schemas. Reconstructive memory causes new information to be distorted by existing schemas. Okay, that's false. And Loftus and Palmer used an independent group design. And that's true. So, moving on. A week later, Loftus and Palmer asked the same participants a series of questions about the accident. This time, the critical question was, did you see any broken glass? There was, in fact, no broken glass in the original video clip. Yet, 32% of participants in the smashed condition said they had seen broken glass, in contrast to 14% in the hit condition. This shows how leading questions have a significant effect on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Furthermore, Loftus and Zanni in 1975 showed that even small differences in the wording of a question can have a significant effect. They divided 150 students into three conditions, two experimental groups and one control group. All three were shown a short film of a car accident. In the experimental group, the participants were asked one of two of the original critical questions, smashed or hit. The control group was not asked to estimate the speed of the vehicles. Did you see a broken headlight? In condition two, the participants were asked, did you see the broken headlight? Although there was no broken headlight in the film, the question asked in condition two implies there was. The findings show that only 7% of those asked about a broken headlight said they had seen it, compared to 17% of those asked about the broken headlight. These findings support the original research. Briefly explain how this research demonstrates reconstructive memory and the effect of retroactive interference on eyewitness testimony. Okay then, if you've uh, returned from pausing the video, the answer is retroactive interference is when new information interferes with old information. Therefore, in this case, the critical question asked, did you see any broken glass? The new information is interfering with the previous memory, i.e. the original video of the crash, which did not have any broken glass in it. Yet 32% of participants in the smashed condition said they had seen broken glass, in contrast to 14% in the hit condition. So, complete the following sentence about misleading information. Tick all that apply. The critical questions in Loftus and Palmer's study contain the following verbs. Smashed, collided, contact, hit, crashed. So you need to tick the ones that are. And in this case, it's A, B, C, and D. There was no crashed in the critical questions. In another study by Loftus et al. in 1978, participants were shown a series of slides that depicted a road traffic accident. One group was shown a critical slide of a car emerging from a junction marked with a stop sign, while the other group was shown the critical slide depicting a yield sign. Half of the participants within each group were asked questions consistent with what they had seen, and the other half were given misleading information. For example, those who were shown a stop sign in the slide were asked a question which referred to a yield sign. After completing the questionnaire, participants were asked to choose the correct slide in a recognition task. Findings showed that only 41% of participants chose the correct slide when they had been given misleading information, compared to 75% of participants who had been asked consistent questions. 
This research has been replicated many times and the results have supported the original research into misleading information. So moving on, the next factor that affects eyewitness testimony is post-event discussion. Another explanation of the, for the findings of Loftus et al's 1978 study is that the questions that the participants had to answer before being asked to identify the critical slides was a form of reconstructive memory that is often referred to as source monitoring. I, did I see an event occur? Did someone tell me about it? Did I read about it? Or did I imagine it? This can lead the witness to mistakenly believe that he or she saw something, for example, a stop sign instead of a yield sign. And in the key terms there, source monitoring is when information from other sources is used to fill in gaps in our memory, leading to the creation of a false memory. When we witness an event, especially a traumatic or emotional event, we try to rationalize and make sense of what we have just seen. To do this, we may seek reassurance from other sources. And as you may remember, this is known as informational influence. And in memory research is known as the conformity effect. This can be done by reading about, about it, discussing with other witnesses, or simply dwelling over the event and reconstructing it in our mind. Each time, the gaps in our original memory are filled with elements from other sources, until it is difficult to truly know the original source of information. The whole process is known as a post-event discussion. Conformity effect. Rationalizing and seeking guidance about the event we have witnessed by looking for other sources for confirmation. A study to investigate post-event discussion was carried out by Wright et al. in 2000. Pairs of participants were shown a series of photos depicting a wallet theft. The photos were identical except for one participant in the, in the pair saw a photo of a thief standing alone, whereas the other saw a photo of the thief with an accomplice. They found that 98% of participants were initially accurate when asked independently whether the thief had an accomplice. However, this dropped to 79% after the pairs had discussed whether the thief was alone. This demonstrated the powerful effects of post-event discussion on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Inspired by the early re research into conformity effects of post-event discussion, Bodner et al. 2000 carried out the following study. Bodner et al. 2009, research into post-event discussion on memory conformity. The aim, to investigate the effects of post-event discussion on memory conformity. Procedure, a lab experiment using an independent group design. In two lab experiments, participants were divided into three groups. Shown a crime video, some participants learned about non-witness details via discussion in pairs, a dyadic group, reading another participant's report, read group, or watching another version of the video, both video group. In experiment one, they had to then report on the event they had seen in the video. In experiment two, participants were asked only to recall information they had seen on the video and not from the secondary source. Results. In experiment one, participants often reported non-witness details with no significant differences between the groups. In experiment two, the participants reported significantly less non-witness details in all groups. Conclusions. Bodner et al. concluded that asking participants to ignore secondary information reduces the negative consequences of post-event discussion, thus improving the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Okay, so let's have a go at this question. Briefly explain what is meant by the term post-event discussion for two marks. And you may want to pause the video at this point. Okay, so welcome back. When we witness an event, especially a traumatic or emotional event, we try to rationalize and make sense of what we have just seen. To do this, we may seek reassurance from other sources. This can be done by reading about it, discussing with other witnesses, or simply dwelling over the event and reconstruct it in our mind. Each time the gaps in our original memory are filled with elements from the other sources, until it is difficult to truly know the original source of information. This whole process is known as post-event discussion. Okay then, you now need to complete the following web task. Write a brief outline of the study, one sentence or two. Evaluate the methods used or ethical issues that arise and say why they support or challenge post-event discussion. Gabba et al's study 
on conformity, can eyewitnesses influence each other's memory for an event? Now all we do here is we actually paste this into Google and you'll find the study. Okay, so welcome back. So in relation to your web task, Gaba et al. in 2003 investigated memory conformity effects between individuals who witness and then discuss a criminal event. They employed a novel procedure whereby each me member of a dyad watches a different video of the same event. Each video contained unique items that were then seen by other witnesses. Dy dyads in one condition were encouraged to discuss the event before each witness individually performed a recall task, while in a control condition dyads were not allowed to discuss the event prior to recall. A significant proportion, 71% of witnesses who had discussed the event went on to mistakenly recall items acquired during the discussion. There was no age-related differences. Evaluation as they used lab experiments, good control, weaknesses lacks mundane realism. Yes, it supports the original post-event discussion on reducing the reliability of eyewitness testimony. <laughs> Evaluation. Strengths. Research into post-event discussion and memory conformity have used laboratory exper experiments with high levels of control, so as high reliability and cause and effect can be established. Supported by lots of research that have found that conformity effects is greater when individuals believe that others that have more experience or knowledge of the situation and studies have also shown that people are more influenced by confident people and by people who they think should have good memories. The research has important practical and real life implications for eyewitness testimony. Limitations. Zaragoza and McCoskey 1989 argue that the results of lab based experiments into the accuracy of eyewitness testimony may be influenced by demand characteristics, i.e. wanting to please the researcher. Foster et al. 1994 argue that the consequences of eyewitness testimony in the lab is not as important as real life eyewitness testimony, so there are issues with ecological validity. Okay, so finally, your homework stroke independent task. Stefan and Charlotte witness an assault outside a nightclub. Stefan says that one of the attackers was wearing a baseball cap, when in fact this was not true. When asked by the police to describe the attacker at the time, Charlotte could provide very little detail, as she said that she was so scared at the time. She dis discusses the matter over and over with Stefan, and a week later, when asked to give a witness statement, she describes the attacker as wearing a baseball cap. So, discuss research into post-event discussion and its effects on the reliability of eyewitness testimony. Refer to the information in the scenario above in your answer. So here you've got four marks of AO1, two marks of application, and four marks of AO3. Importantly, obviously refer to the scenario. Really apply your knowledge to the scenario. Okay, you may want to pause your video and return to this a bit later. Okay then, so welcome back. So here's a suggested answer. A study to investigate post-event discussion was carried out by Wright et al. 2000. Pairs of participants were shown a, f a series of photo photos depicting a wallet theft. The photos were identical except that one participant in the pair saw a photo in the th of the thief standing alone, whereas the other saw a photo of the thief with an accomplice. They found that 98% of participants were initially accurate when asked independently whether the thief had an accomplice. However, this dropped to 79% after the pairs had discussed with each other whether the thief was alone. Seeking reassurance from other, others and then changing our own opinion towards theirs is known as conformity effects and highlights the powerful effects of post-event discussion on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, indicating that post-event discussion reduces the reliability of eyewitness testimony. This is demonstrated in the scenario as Charlotte could provide very little detail as she said she was so scared at the time. So seeking reassurance, she discusses the matter over and over with Stefan. Each time the gaps in our original memory are filled with elements from Stefan's account until it is difficult to truly know the original source of the information. And a week later, when asked to give a witness statement, she describes the attacker as wearing a baseball cap. Research into post-event discussion and memory conformity 
has used laboratory experiments with higher levels of control so high reliability and cause and effect can be established. Supported by lots of research that have found that conformity effects are greater than individuals and believe that others have more experience or knowledge of the situation and studies have also shown that people are more influenced by confident people and by people who think they have good memories. In this case Charlotte lacks confidence and Stefan seems to know more about the attacker so Charlotte's memories have changed. The researcher has important practical and real life implications for eyewitness testimony. However, Sarah Gossa and McCoskey, 1989, argue that the results of lab-based experiments into the accuracy of eyewitness testimony may be influenced by demand characteristics, i.e. wanting to please the researcher. And finally, Foster et al., 1994, argue that the consequences of eyewitness testimony in the lab is not as important as real life eyewitness testimony. So there are issues with ecological validity. Just a point here, Bodner's research is probably not relevant as Charlotte is not asked to ignore Stefan's account. Okay, so just bear that in mind. And that brings us to the end of this lesson. Hopefully I'll see you at the next lesson.